days, you can engineer microbes to produce anything from dairy proteins to CBD, although it doesn't always make commercial sense. I'm here in Singapore at the Asia-Pacific Agri-Food Innovation Summit with Michelle Stansfield from Cauldron, which is developing a continuous fermentation approach, which it claims could transform the unit economics of precision fermentation. By having these smaller, smarter, cheaper facilities, the capital costs actually drive down the techno-economic modelling, but also we get an increased efficiency out of these fermenters, so we get 20% more protein out of a 100,000 litre continuous line than you would get out of a 500,000 litre batch line. And if you look at the difference in capitals, that's, that's huge. Okay, and that's, yeah. the, that's the, the disruptive nature of the, the cauldron technology where you can look at having a dedicated manufacturing facility for less than 30 million USD when it might cost you 100 to 200 million USD to build a 500,000 litre batch fermentation process. So it's an interesting model and I think in the current economy it's, it's important. I don't think that the VCs are going to want to raise for $300 million plants anymore. They, if they see an option like Cauldron, they will start looking at that and driving their, their customers to use that sort of technology. So can you explain the difference between a batch and a continuous process? So in a batch process you will go into your plant, you'd clean your fermenter, you'd sterilise your fermenter, you would clean your fermenter, you would sterilise your fermenter, you'd fill it, fill it full of media which has a certain amount of sugar. You then put your culture in, it takes a little while for it to start growing through the baby phase, that's quite slow and then it'll grow very quickly if we call it the logarithmic phase and that's where it grows very quickly, it's the teenage years, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s and then once the sugar runs out it slows down and then it becomes an old person at that point and less productive. That's a batch fermentation. So you finish, you finish your batch fermentation once you've run out of, of media or sugar or, or some sort of nutrient. And then you harvest it and then you start that process all yeah, over again. Yes, yes, so then you harvest it or you send it into the induction phase, the production phase, and you then do your, create your molecule, clean the fermenters down, start again. We're in a continuous fermentation. You start it, you hold it there for a long period of time so you get a lot more productivity because you're not cleaning the fermenters and things like that. So some of the challenges that I've been told around a continuous process are twofold. One, the risk of contamination and the other one, this risk of strain mutation or Just drift. Yes. Can you speak about how you can address those challenges? So we do that twofold. Um, We've been doing continuous fermentation for a very long time and holding it without it being contaminated. So the longest ferment we've done for a biomass ferment was eight months and 24 days. We only shut it down because it was Christmas and that was at 10,000 litres. So we have confidence that we're able to keep the ferment clean. What we're trying to establish now through our, our seed phase is can that, those yeasts that have come from the continuous fermentation, can they go into a production or an induction ferment? And if we can do that, how long until we start seeing a genetic drift? But we believe that because the continuous fermentation is just for biomass, that we probably won't see the genetic drift, but our cost mo models are based on a very conservative ferment period. So we won't be fermenting for eight months and 24 days, it'll be a shorter period. So any benefits we see will be upside in the cost model. So from an equipment perspective, what are the implications of running a continuous process? Have you got some specialised kind of bioreactor whereby you've got separate chambers or uh, for a, the growth phase versus the production phase? You know, how, what, how does it work in practice? The first iteration of a cauldron will be a biomass fermenter. So we will do the biomass fermenter and we have a proprietary design for that fermenter that allows us to have really good heat exchange and oxygen transfer because that's really something that you come up, you limit when it comes to continuous fermentation. The biomass will then be transferred into a batch induction phase in the first iteration and that will be the same as what we're seeing in all the other facilities. So they will be decoupled in the first instance which what allows us to do is create more yeast coming through but it also allows our customers confidence that the induction will be done according to their protocol so they can really understand and, and be sure that that the fermentation will work. So what kinds of products lend themselves best to a continuous process? You know, I'm aware that Lanzatech uses continuous process but ethanol 
production, for example? Does it only work, you know, for certain uh, ingredients or um, No, we don't believe. So the continuous fermentation is the biomass creation step. So we have technology and experience with PKR, with filamentous fungi. We've got technology for E. coli and, and algae as well. So we're able to do biomass creation with those with those chassis. Yeah. And what we're seeing is it, because we have decoupled the biomass fermentation from the induction, we're not seeing any sort of changes to the way the molecule is actually created. So it lends itself to any sort of technology that, or molecule creation that would be in those particular chassis mm. or the, the species. But ultimately, we believe our technology will unlock cost of goods for high volume, low value products like caseins and beta lactoglobulins. That's what we ultimately want to do. And we want to do that because we want to shift the needle when it comes to climate change. If our technology is only going to work for lactoferrin, then we don't have a company. So tell me a bit about the um, origin story for Cauldron and uh, how it's funded. I understand there's you know, a backstory here involving agri-technology and main sequence ventures. Yes, so I worked for agri-technology for the last 12 years. I was the general manager of the company, our chief scientist. Um, Dr. Graham Hobbell was with Agrotechnology as well. The founders of Agrotechnology, David and Polly McLennan, they've been trying to use microbes for food since the 60s. So David helped by, build the ICI bioreactor in the 60s. And what they have realized over the last 30 to 40 years is the only way to get unit economics for food is use a continuous fermentation methodology. So they've been working on that for 35 years. What they weren't able to do or didn't have the resources to do as a family owned company was just commercialize that and make that available to the customers. So we saw that opportunity when we started working with the likes of Nourish and Eden Brew to, to apply this technology to them. And at that point, Agrotechnology asked me to create an exit for them. So I created an exit through creating Cauldron with Main Sequence Ventures and we acquired the intellectual property, physical and business assets out of agri-technology. So we're based in regional New South Wales in Australia. So if you look at a map of Australia, we're three and a half hours west of Sydney. We're in the wine region. It's beautiful, wonderful food. Um, we have a 25,000 litre demonstration facility which involves two 10,000 litre manufacturing lines. We also have 150 litre fermenters 50 litre fermenters, 2 litre fermenters, so a whole bunch of scale up equipment. That's what we have in the Orange facility. And now what we're looking to do is build our first full scale factory. Um, we're hoping to break ground in April next year in a regional location in Australia in the first instance. So we have an, a number of models that we're exploring, but at, in, at the moment we are a contract manufacturing company and we use our demonstration facility to demonstrate to a company that if they come and use our continuous fermentation, they'll get those cost of goods benefits that we claim. That's what we do on our current existing facility. And then those companies then graduate with us into our contract manufacturing facilities, um, which will be located um, alongside agricultural companies around the world. We also are investigating with some companies, obviously there's some companies that already have manufacturing capability. Can we license that technology to those companies? If they've already spent $300 million on a plant, can we just license that technology? Because ultimately for us, it's about shifting the needle on the industry, not, not just winning ourselves.